So, can you tell the difference between these two assets? If they look quite the same to you, great, it means the shader is working as intended. The core difference between the two materials is that the one on the right uses only one texture. So what you say? Let me say that again. This material is obtaining the same result this other one is achieving by sampling a diffuse, a roughness, a normal and a displacement map with just one texture. And why bother doing a thing like this? Fair question to ask. Aside from the pure enjoyment of the challenge and the fact that for me is a chance to explain quite a few cool things that you can now learn, this is among the most important kind of stuff to explore in video game development at this point in time. See, nowadays we have crazy hardware, capable of crunching an unimaginable amount of operation in a split second. I mean, did you see the last generation of GPUs? That stuff is mad. But do you know where currently we more often find bottlenecks when making pretty graphics? Memory. Which is fun actually, because now the trend is to use more triangles, bigger textures, not caring anymore about doing assets properly, and so on. All stuff that, guess what, uses more memory. Not saying that we shouldn't keep pushing the boundaries, but knowing that, if we can find a reliable way on a big game to texture every asset with one map instead of three or four, I think it can be quite a big deal. So, what is this map and how can it do the job of four? Let's find out. The goal for this video is very simple. Go to Quixel Mega Scan, grab a random material, import it to a reel, apply it on a surface, and then make another material that looks identical but uses only one texture. So, the first thing to understand is for sure what type of information this single texture will contain. Let's analyze the textures that make up this material and decide what to keep and what not. The roughness is a very important map, it makes the material look smooth and shiny or more matte. This specific case is a bit unfortunate though, since it's almost a uniform color. Let's scrap it. The normal map is also extremely important, it modulates how the surface reacts with the light to add loads of details to a simple geometry. Let's scrap that too. All we're left is the base color and the height. I'd say that's enough. Let's slap the second one into the alpha channel of the first one and we're good to go. I have to say that when I started working at this video, I was expecting the texture to be something completely different, but this actually makes lots of sense if you think about it. Since the target material is one made with photogrammetry, the only texture information that comes out of the process is exactly the base color, all the rest is usually derived from it or the geometry after the scan. Anyways, this is the only one texture that our shader will be allowed to sample. Let's see how to deal with it. Good, so now our cylinder is nicely colored and displaced. If you're wondering why I separated the texture fetch into distinct nodes, it's just to be more comfortable. And since the base color sample is run on the pixel shader while the tessellation one on the vertex, they will be compiled as two separated fetches anyways. So, first thing to do now is to rebuild somehow the normal. This can be done by sampling multiple times the height map. We need to fetch the pixels sitting right on the left, right, above and below the one we would normally sample, and then run some simple math. To be able to locate the neighbor pixel, we have to first know how big a pixel is in UV space to add that value as an offset along the U or the V. Luckily, this data is available to us. Let's put our texture in a texture object node, let's save it to a named root node because it will be handy, and run it through a texture property node. Here we can choose to output the texture size or the texel size, which is actually the reciprocal of the size and what we are looking for, the pixel size. Let's save it to another named root node too. Let's put in the graph four texture samples and hook our texture and UVs to them. Now we have to make, as previously said, each one of them fetch one of the neighbors of the pixel our UVs are currently telling them to sample. Let's put an add node between the UVs and the samplers and get the texel size once for each of them. 
Now we need to transform this value to a directional offset along the UVs, and to do that we simply need to multiply it each time by the direction we want the offset to be. Now let's figure out how to transform 4 8 map pixels into one normal map pixel. Let's calculate the difference of the samples offset along U and the one of the samples offset along V. Be careful to not get the order wrong, otherwise you'll get flipped normal. A thing that you may actually be interested in if working with OpenGL instead of DirectX like in Unity. And these are the R and G components of our normals. That's it. To explain why this works, let's imagine to be looking at a cross-section of an 8-map. These are the single pixels, taller the whiter they are on the hypothetical texture. Let's say we want to calculate the normal of this pixel here through the application of the subtraction of the neighbors we just did. To simplify things, let's also say that our normal is bidimensional. It can point only from the left to up to the right. As we know, the components of a normalized vector can only range from minus 1 to 1 and the length of the vector itself must be 1. Moreover, the pixels of an 8-map can range only from 0 to 1. Let's keep this in mind. We can visualize the evaluation of the two neighbors as if we want to know the normal of the plane that sits on them. If the two pixels have the same value, their difference will be zero. The plane will be flat and the normal will be pointing straight up. If the left pixel is lower than the right one, their difference will be negative, which would result in a normal tilted to the left. If the left is greater instead, like in this case, the normal will be tilted to the right and the greater the the difference the greater the tilt, while always staying in range, since the edge case for the pixels will be that one of them equals 0 and the other one equals 1. Anyways, now that we understand why we're doing this, we can use the node derive normal z to get our full 3D normal vector. The amazing thing of this approach is that we get a tangent space normal straight away, like the usual textures. Um, this thing doesn't seem to be doing much, let's visualize the normal buffer. This can happen only if the normal map we're calculating is completely blue, which means that all the normal vector's values are exactly or pretty close to 001. And as we learned a few minutes ago, this can happen only if the difference between the neighbor pixel pairs are minuscule. Let's check it, this could be the case. It looks exactly like it. We can barely tell that this whole thing is not a uniform color, so the vector outputted by our filter is only very slightly tilted for sure. Luckily, this is a pretty easy fix. We can modulate the normal intensity by scaling it up before deriving its last component. And now we can clearly see that our filter is working, even though the result has few problems. What are those black spots? They are coming out from the derived normal Z node. It's returning a broken value where the input RG vector is longer than 1. You can realize this by noticing that we can see it only where the normal should have the maximum inclination. Since we are manually scaling it, we have no idea if we are going out of range somewhere, so let's make sure we don't. We can add an if statement that normalizes the 2D vector if it's longer than 1, right after our intensity modulation. We we can calculate the squared vector length of the vector by doing the dot product against itself and compare it to 1. Now, if the vector length is less than 1, we can just pass it through as it is. Otherwise, we can normalize it by calculating the square root of the squared length to have the actual length of the vector, and we can use this value to divide the vector itself. And the black spots are gone. Actually, we still have some. I guess that node has some issues if the RG vector is exactly 1 or maybe of floating point precision issues, who knows. Let's avoid that for good by simply making sure that the RG vector gets incredibly close to a length of 1 but never reaches it. While we are this close, we can also notice a weird artifact that goes all across our normal. There are like little steps. Sadly, there's not much we can do about it, since the issue comes from the texture compression. 
likely is not noticeable at all. Let's now move our attention to the roughness. To be honest here, we could just set a uniform value and barely notice the difference, but I'm too finicky to do that. But the fact that I can barely see the different values here remains though. So I'll just contrast a bit the reference roughness to see everything a bit more clearly. Now we will aim to reproduce this result as best as we can, so that later we can remap the values to match the original texture. First question to ask ourselves is where we can take the data from. In this case we will go a bit freestyle and start from creating a mask through color picking and then we'll mess around a bit to make it fit. The first step consists in choosing a color on the base color map and creating a gradient that tells us for each pixel how similar its color is to the one we chose. To do that, let's decide which color we want to pick. By looking a bit at both the base color and the roughness, I'd say that the darkest tones on the first match with the lightest on the second, more or less. So, let's create a vector tree, open its color picker and then use the eyedropper to manually select the color we are interested in. Remember to do this pick while visualizing the base color buffer, otherwise you'll get the color's value after the lighting, post process and so on are applied. Now we have to subtract this value from our base color map and calculate the length of the resulting vector, which will be shorter the more each pixel color of the texture is closer to the value we picked. But we are not going to calculate the usual Euclidean length of the vector, we're gonna use the Manhattan distance for it. If you haven't ever heard about it, you have to know that there are many many ways of calculating a distance from point to point, depending on the reference system and the type of space we're working with. In this case, the Manhattan distance refers to a space where, let's say, you can't move diagonally, you can just walk along the exact direction of the axis, like on a checkerboard. If you want to know more, you can google more info by yourself, otherwise you can subscribe to my channel, I have a video on this topic on its way. Anyways, the implementation for it looks like this. We take the absolute of the difference to be sure we have only positive values and we add all the components together. The result will be zero if the pixel is exactly colored as the color we picked and it will be brighter and brighter the less it is similar to it. I think this can be a good base to work with. We can see some similarities with the reference map. Now it's just a matter to mess a bit around with this gradient to make it fit as much we can. We can start by clamping the map in a 0-1 range, since with the Manhattan distance you can clearly see that we can have off-range values, and inverting it. To match a bit more the color curve, we have to make the darkest colors darker, while leaving the whites as they are. To do that, we can raise the gradient to a power, the higher the exponent, the darker the image. I'd say that's close enough, all the main colors blocks are in the right place and the distribution is pretty similar. Now it's time to add some details. See here, we are completely missing these white spots. If we go back to the base color, we immediately see that they all correspond to these white patches on the bark. So, let's add another color pick and see if we manage to get them too. Let's duplicate the whole color picking chunk and change the value we're interested in. We can see that we're kind of getting them, even though they're very small and dark. Let's not forget that we copied over also the color correction, so we're actually making the gradient darker than it is. Let's remove the power. Much better, but not bright enough yet. Let's hook up the power again, but this time before the 1- node. Now we're talking, by making the map darker before inverting it, we're actually making the final result brighter. The only thing left now is to mix together the two gradients we have generated. Since we just want the white spots of this second map to come over the first one, we can simply use a max node. Pretty close, we just have to match better the value ranges. The reference doesn't look like going from pure black to pure white, if not seen from very close. 
To modulate the value range of our map, we can use a LERP node to remap our 01 ranging values to values ranging from number A to number B. And now we have it. It's not perfect but still pretty close. And let's also consider that originally the roughness map was basically a flat color. All this variety is very noticeable. Let's go back to our final render. We're now very close to our reference, but I think we can still push it a bit more. If we look the bark details, our version is still missing some bits of higher frequency pumps. It would be nice to add them and make the surface feel a bit more crunchy. To do that, we can recycle the new knowledge we just acquired while working on the roughness and readapt it to what we're doing to calculate the normal. Since the normal is based on a height map, we're free to mess around with those grayscale values before running our filter. In this way, we can modulate the vectors that come out of this. If we run the same color peaking on each sample, we can obtain 4 times the same gradient, with the same offset as the height map, and we can add it as a high frequency detail to the height data. This time though, I guess we want a much less contrasty looking map, so let's remove the power node and replace it with an inverse slurp. With this node we can specify which value range to remap to the usual 01. Last thing to do before adding this gradient is to scale it way down, remember, it's just a high frequency detail. For our highs, it may be barely noticeable on the height map itself, but as a normal we can definitely see the difference. Let's have a bit of a technical chat now, because I want to share some thoughts on this experiment, and I'm really curious to hear your opinions on this. Would it be worth to use a shader like this instead of the usual textures? As always, it depends, but there are a few things that we can surely say. It is definitely a gain in memory footprint of the project. Even though an RGBA texture weighs as two RGB textures when compressed, if it does at least the job of two or even better three, it's good. On the other hand, to compensate for the fact we're working with just one texture, we're sampling it five times, which shouldn't be good, right? As I said at the beginning of the video, the slowest operation that the GPU can do is going to the memory to grab data, which includes fetching pixels from a texture. In this case though, we're doing a very good job in making sure we leverage the GPU cache as best we can. Let me explain why. Every time the GPU has to read a pixel from a texture, it doesn't just grab the one it needs for that specific pixel and that's it. Since it's spending so much time to reach the memory, it grabs as many adjacent pixels as it can, until it fills the cache. So, since we're sampling adjacent pixels, there's a very high chance that they will already be in cache, resulting in very fast, almost free, texture fetches. And the rest of the shader is made of very simple operation that nowadays can be executed at the speed of light. A real weakness of this approach, in my opinion, is the fact that it would unlikely be generalizable enough to build a reliable pipeline with fixed rules to use it in production. Sure, you can parameterize many things here, but it's not guaranteed that you'll be able to reproduce, let's say, any type of bark roughness by using only two color peaks, for example. On the other hand, it may be worth implementing something like this in a photogrammetry heavy project since you still have to manually create all the texture set after the scan. It will just be a matter of moving that bit of the process from a different app directly into a real, which may be a big pipeline improvement actually. Speaking of which, would you like to explore more the world of photogrammetry and its hidden secrets? Let me know in the comments and maybe it will be the topic of a future video.